Uh, my name is Peter Johnson. I'm Director of Undergraduate Admissions, and it's my privilege today to introduce our afternoon faculty speaker, uh, Professor Don Melnick. Uh, Professor Melnick is Thomas Hunt Morgan Professor of Conservation Biology in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology at Columbia University. He's also the director of the Center for Environment, Economy, and Society, a group that integrates natural science, economics, and business in an effort to conserve biological diversity at global, national, and local scales. A magna cum laude graduate in anthropology and history from New York University, he was also a member of Phi Beta Kappa there. He received his doctorate in physical anthropology focusing on molecular genetics from Yale University, and then joined the Columbia Faculty University in 2000. Professor Melnick developed the blueprint for the creation of the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Envir Environmental Biology, or what we call E3B. Now, he also spearheaded the process leading to its acceptance by the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in 2001, thus creating the first truly new Columbia Arts and Science Department in over half a century. Most recently, Professor Melnick assumed the role of co-chair of the United Nations Millennium Task Force on Environmental Sustainability. Professor Melnick is currently advising several heads of state around the world on ways to achieve environmentally sustainable economic growth. In this effort, he's helping each country to integrate the best science with the political and economic imperatives that currently exist and will exist in the future. For 30 years, he's used molecular genetics to explain aspects of the ecology, behavior, evolution, and conservation of vertebrates. Now, a side story about Professor Melnick that shows his true devotion to the lives of undergraduates. Uh, for six years, he was one of our faculty in residence, actually living in a residence hall and creating programs for students in that residence hall, tying uh, interesting academic issues to residence life issues. Uh, Professor Melnick has agreed, uh, after we're finished uh, with his presentation, to stay and answer questions from students. Uh, thank you, Professor Melnick. <laughs> Excuse me while I switch microphones. I think this microphone's on. Can you hear me? Ah, great. Well, it's a big turnout. Thanks for coming. Um, actually, I'll tell you a very quick, funny story about uh, when our, we were the faculty family in residence in Shapiro Hall, which is just uh, a block uh, to the west. Um, I think there were about 420 undergraduates saying that we used to try to have programs where we would invite well-known people in, from New York to the program and then, and invite, then invite students. And uh, one evening we had um, Wynton Marsalis come, first for a dinner with about 20 students, which was really fun for the students. Then we went across the hall to a bigger area for dessert for the, any other students that wanted to attend. And the one thing he insisted was that he was not going to bring his any instruments and play instruments. He was not going to play music. And over the course of the evening, all he did was describe this and that and then use his fingers like this and simulate a trumpet just by playing. He did that all evening long, so he didn't come with an instrument. It was a great evening, and to me it was really indicative of Columbia College students because everything he said, they challenged him on. Everything. At the end of it, he sort of left going, God, I'm exhausted. This is incredible. Um, so, anyway, um, I'm going to give a talk today a about what it's been like to be uh, a university scientist for the last 30 years. Um, and I know there are a lot of students who are thinking about Columbia, and I know that all of you have self-identified um, as uh, interested in science. So I'm going to mix sort of uh, science with experiences that have happened along the way. Okay. So we'll start from the beginning, the early years. Um, I know the images are not so great because of the light coming in, the ambient light. But in any case, this is actually a, a, an aerial view of this neighborhood in the 1950s, actually. And um, 
of Morningside Heights neighborhood. And this is actually, uh, was called Women's Hospital, um, is where I was born. I was actually born only about five or six blocks from here. Um, the hospital was torn down shortly after. I don't think the two things are related, my being born and that. But it, it did go, and it doesn't exist anymore. It's on 110th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus. Um, and my parents uh, moved out, you know, as part of the sort of post-World War II, post-Korean War, moved out to the suburbs, because there was money available to move out to the suburbs. And we went out to the suburbs. And so I grew up in a really small town, really small, like 5,000 people. And uh, you can see, you know, down by the railroad tracks, and I just look like a little small town kid. Um, but I always was extremely interested in nature. Um, so I had a butterfly collection. That's an actual picture of my butterfly collection. I still have that butterfly collection. Unfortunately, some of those species are no longer in the place where I grew up. They've been locally extirpated. Um, in addition, I love to go to the shore. This is actually on the North Shore. You can tell because it's all pebbles. The North Shore of Long Island, it's all pebbles. The Long Island Sound has pebbles. Um, and um, I have a shell collection, still have my shell collection that I've continued to collect over all these years. Um, notice those snazzy binoculars I have around there. Those are pretty cool, huh? So I was kind of a budding naturalist, and I really, really love nature. I won't go into all of the uh, stories about how much time I... But I, one of the things I really loved to do as a kid was to climb to the tallest tree. We lived near a big wooded area that had once been a farm and had grown back as forest. Climb to the tallest tree because I really wanted to see what it was like to be a bird, what it would be like, to, what a bird would see when they were looking down. Um, needless to say, this did not, my mother didn't appreciate this habit of climbing to the tallest tree. Um, so when I was about eight or nine years old, I came out one day in the yard and I saw this. And you, you have to realize this was sort of the late 50s, early 1960s when it was the Cold War. Uh, we were all afraid of uh, being bombed, of an atomic bomb. You know, we'd have these crazy drills where we'd go underneath the desks and put our hands over our head as if that was going to protect us against an atomic bomb. But we would do that anyway. And um, so there were a lot of movies. And these movies, they all had this theme. The theme was there's atomic testing out in a desert somewhere, and it creates a mutant form of an insect, and some large ants or large flies or something like that um, uh, emerges and begins to attack the human population. So I came out and I saw this thing. And to me, it looked like a fly after I was only about eight years old. And it was pretty big. It was like three, three and a half inches, I thought. I went running in the house and I said, we have one, one of these irradiated flies. You know, it's incredible. Um, later on, I learned that it was a cicada and that they come out periodically either every seven or every 17 years. And I did a lot of research on cicada. I got a notebook. Remember those old notebooks? Maybe you still have them. The sort of black and white marbly on the front, right, with the label. I got one of those, and I went to the library, and I wrote up all this stuff about cicadas. Um, I have no idea why I did that, but I did it. And of course, I had three older brothers who gave me no end of grief for doing something like that. But in any case, to me, it was indicative of my interest in science. But of course, I was still just a person. And so, you know, then the late 60s came, that was the early 60s, the late 60s came, and I began to spend much more of my time at the Fillmore East, which no longer exists anymore, you know, watching Jimi Hendrix concerts than I did doing any research on cicadas. Um, but eventually I emerged out of that, and, and, and re, despite the fact that I did an undergraduate degree in anthropology and in history, two majors, um, I still maintained the, an interest the whole time I was an undergraduate, and decided to go to graduate school in science, um, which is what I did. Um, and that led to me sort of to the next stage of my life of being a basic scientist. Well, one of the interests I told you I had was in nature. So when I approached science, I wanted to somehow be outdoors and be in nature. Um, and so there you see, this is my first research project. I'm a little furrier in this uh, photo than I am now. Um, and this is taken probably about 32 years ago. Uh, and where I am there is actually in the foothills to the Himalayas. I'm up in the, at about 10,000 feet, and it's very faint because of the lighting, but in the back you'll see some white cap mountains. Those are the really big ones. That's the Pir Punjal, where you'll see K2 and Nanga Parbat, the tallest mountains in the world. Um, and I spent two years actually living up in, in, the, in the foothills of the Himalayas. And what I was doing actually was studying these. Now, again, it's a little faint. But these are rhesus monkeys that live up in the northern altitudes, northern latitudes and very high altitudes. Very unusual for primates. And so um, a close friend of mine 
and uh, the woman who was eventually become my wife, uh, they were going to go out and do this research, and I decided, since I was a geneticist, I'm going to figure out a way to integrate my interest in genetics into this project, and, um, and I went out as well. And we lived there with, along with several other people for, for a number of years. Um, so, what I, I went out to do something, and I'm going to tell you, give you the punchline first, uh, and this is really important if you want to be a scientist. I went out and spent two years doing research to prove something that I ended up not proving. I failed to prove this. Um, in fact, what everyone said was true was true, and I was wrong. And that's really important to uh, confront because that happens over and over again when you do science. So this is what we call jelly bean genetics because the prevailing theory at that time, I, I work in an area called population genetics. That is, how, are, how is genetic variation distributed in populations and why? Okay. The prevailing theory was that genes basically spread throughout a population in a random fashion. So it would be like if you closed your eyes and just stuck your hand in the jelly bean jar and pulled out a jelly bean. Well, if you look at the one on the left, you'll see nine of them are red and one is yellow. So your chance of getting a red one is 90%. Right? And that's basically what the theory was. It is whatever the frequency of the genes are in the population, that's what will be um, sampled from in creating the next generation. And that's it. And that's how it will proceed. Just, now, I couldn't believe that that was true. And the reason I couldn't believe it was true, because when you look at how monkeys are organized, they're socially organized. They're social mammals. They have these polygamous social groups with multiple males, multiple females that mate with one another. The females actually never leave the group they're born into. They stay in that group their whole life. And their daughters do. And their granddaughters do. Okay? So that, to me, said it can't be random, because they're not moving. So every group can't be a random selection of all the genes in the whole population, because they're not moving. The males, on the other hand, are dispersing all over. And there is a skewed sex ratio, so there are many, many more females at adulthood than there are males, even though at birth that's not true, because what do males do? They engage in risky behavior, and they die. Right? They get injured, and they die. That's not that different from humans. Right? <laughs> Adolescent males engage in very risky behavior and often get themselves hurt. Um, also, there's a very high var uh, variance, uh, a lot of variability in reproductive output in males, not in females. Females seem to have offspring at a regular, it's every year, every other year. Males, there's a dominance hierarchy. If they get beat up and run off, they don't actually mate with females. And so there's a lot of variability. So I looked at all this and I said, it can't be jelly bean genetics. This can't be the way it works there's some non-random way in which genes are being dispersed throughout the population. So we went out. This is the range, that, that, that sort of stippled area. That's the range of the rhesus monkey. It has the biggest range of any primate other than humans. It's a huge range. And there is the part. You can see the red circle. Does this have a, I don't know if it has a light, but if you see the red circle, um, you'll see that's the area we were working in. The north, see it says NWFB, the Northwest Frontier Province of Pakistan. It's a spectacularly beautiful area. It's gotten a lot of bad press lately, obviously, because of uh, uh, recent events over the last 10 years or so. But it's an absolutely spectacular area, um, an ecologically very interesting area. OK. So we did genetics the hard way because we couldn't do it the way you can do now. That is to get DNA using these techniques that you've all seen on CSI or whatever. You just need a tiny little bit of material, and you can get all the DNA you want. We couldn't do that then. We had to actually get blood samples. So we had to trap these animals, take blood samples. We had to do it in a, in a very responsible manner, tranquilize the animals, keep them till they were fully up, only get whole groups at once, take the whole group back to their home range and release them all at once. Everything had to be done. And I can actually say that about 500 trappings, we never lost an animal. So I'm really pleased that we, that happened. And all the groups were fine after we released them. Um, but anyway, it was very, very tough work. So what did I find? OK, this pie chart won't mean much until I explain it. If, in fact, right, that it is just random the way the genes are moving around the population, right, then that pie, which represents the total amount of genetic diversity in this area that we worked in, that pie, right, most of it right, should be of that stippled type. Okay? When you see a pie where most of it is stippled like that, that means genes are basically being distributed around the population at random. It means that all the genetic variation in the area can be found in every single one of these social groups, because it's just moving over the landscape. And that's what you see. And only 4% of that variation 
actually is made up of differences between groups, which is tiny. This is essentially random. I was wrong. It is jelly bean genetics. Okay? But I still couldn't believe that that was. I mean, I didn't come all this way to find out that I was wrong. So we looked at samples from other areas. You see those different letters of sampling other parts of the range. And we looked at it at different levels. The one I just showed you is in the upper left. Then we looked at differences between local populations within the region, which is the one in the upper right. Again, most of the circle is stippled, which means the genes are being randomly distributed over, over an even larger area than we thought, a whole region. Then we looked at regions within the range of the species. Most of the genetic variation in the entire species can be found in little social groups or in local populations, showing you it is just completely random the way the genetic variation goes. I still wasn't satisfied. As I said, I didn't come all this way to be wrong. So I looked at other species. Again, the same thing. I'm still wrong. OK. Now, the reason for this probably is because of these dispersing males. Because males leave the group they're born into when they become sexually mature, and they may go to multiple groups over the course of their lifetime. So imagine the landscape where these males are moving around, and what are they doing? They're leaving their genes wherever they go. Okay. So that's why this thing is, when you look at the genetic variation that's contributed by both parents, meaning what we have in our nuclear genome, right, all those chromosomes, there's so much coming in from the males that it's overwhelming the fact that the females are not moving around, and it's giving this basically a random distribution of genetic variation. That's the explanation. But still, females are not moving around. So I said, I've got to find the signature, the genetic signature for females not moving around. It's got to be there somewhere. And where was it? Well, this is, a, it's again, a little hard to see. This is another species of macaque monkey. You see the, the mother in the, in the middle, and then you'll see a bunch of different offspring of different ages. That's what you see when you look at social groups. There'll be a series of adult males, and then you'll see their offspring, mostly their female offspring, because the male offspring move off once they become mature. Right? So what I looked at was I tried to find something that is inherited through the maternal line. Now, I don't know how many of you know this. You probably should know this from your high school biology classes, that we have two different genomes in our cells. We have the genome we normally talk about, which are the chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell. But we have this other genome in these little energy-producing factories called mitochondria in our cells. And they have their own DNA. And that DNA is that circular loop of DNA you see on the right side. Very small, um, but um, a good signature. Why is it a good signature? because everybody in here is a clone of their mother with respect to mitochondrial DNA. Because you get the mitochondrial DNA from the cytoplasm of the egg. There are some mitochondria in the sperm, but they never get incorporated into the fertilized egg. So all you have are copies of the mitochondrial DNA of your mother. Okay. So I said, now if I look at something that is strictly maternally inherited, I'm going to have to pick up a signature of the fact that females are not moving around. Because males are not contributing to that. I'm going to get this, right? And I did. Fantastic. So instead of the pie on the left, which is the nuclear variation, what you find in the chromosomes, being mostly stippled, you can see there's only a small amount of it is stippled on the right pie. And that is, that's the amount of variation that's shared among groups and populations. And the black part is the amount of, of total variation that's unique. And why is it unique? Because if females are born in a group, they have a particular mitochondrial genetic makeup, and they never leave that group. They stay in that group their whole life. Their daughters stay in that group. Their granddaughters stay in that group. And so you can see that it becomes highly specialized or highly localized in each little area. And there are big differences between the areas. Whereas the nuclear variation is pretty much homogenized across the landscape. So I did actually find this. And what it did was, so I was completely failed in my original uh, experiment, natural experiment. But it forced me to go and take a look at this. And I found this signature of uh, this, the way in which females are organized in populations. It led me to look more at mitochondrial DNA. I don't have time to go into it. But mitochondrial DNA has become a very, very important tool in evolutionary genetics. And it led me to do a lot of research on that and how it works out, not only in populations at the present, but how it plays itself out over time. And the fact that when you reconstruct evolutionary history using mitochondrial DNA, you get a very different picture than when you use nuclear DNA. And what you're getting is two snapshots. And you can also use Y chromosome DNA that only comes through the maternal line. You get three snapshots. You get these three snapshots of what happened over evolutionary time at any given point. And you put those three snapshots together, and you get a real story. 
Whereas if you just used one, you'd only get what I would say is a bias story. <clears throat> so this was a lot of fun, and I decided I would work on all these other kinds of monkeys, and I started working on apes and all kinds of other primates, and doing the same kind of work. And then, uh, while I was happily going about doing this, this was in 19, this would be 1986 now, um, if you see that circle that just popped up on the slide, did everyone see that over in the lower left corner? I was doing work on the island of Sri Lanka. Does everyone know Sri Lanka? It's off the south, uh, the southern coast of the uh, peninsula of India. And I was doing work in Sri Lanka um, right as the Civil War was going into full steam, which was interesting in and of itself. I have many stories about that that I could tell. Um, and um, something happened. And the thing that happened actually changed my, the course of my research life completely. Um, and probably changed the course of my life completely. So I was driving down the road. We had all the provisions we needed. We were off in a relatively remote area. We were working on a different species of primate, uh, another monkey, actually not terribly distantly related from the rhesus monkey. And had the Jeep all loaded up with provisions. We were headed up now for about two or three months. And on the way to the field site, we came upon an elephant. Okay, now this is an Asian elephant. Asian elephants, for the most part, don't have the large tusks like the African elephants. Their ears are different, their ears are smaller. Um, they tend to be a little bit smaller. Um, now, anyone who's ever spent any time with elephants know that despite the fact that elephants are large, and most of the films you see of elephants are them charging and making a lot of noise, elephants are incredibly quiet when they want to be, incredibly quiet. So I pulled the Jeep off to the side of the road. It's the first time I'd seen a wild elephant. Stop, turned the engine off, and sat there watching the elephant for the longest time. And what elephants do, you talk to anyone who's done research on elephants, what the elephant did was eventually the elephant just disappeared. What it does is it slowly drifts off to the forest, but very, very slowly and imperceptibly, and then all of a sudden it's gone. Okay, and then you start asking, did we just see an elephant? But we did see an elephant. Well, this was spectacular to me. I, this was a really, really great, uh, I told you I really like nature, so you can imagine. I thought this was an incredible moment. Um, so we go up to the, our research site, we spend two months there, we're running out of things, I decide to drive back, and I drive back, and that's the area that we, I just showed you. That's what the area looks like. And if you can't see, because it's sort of faded, the entire forest was burned to the ground, completely burned to the ground. There were no animals, there were no birds, and no elephants, or anything. It was just had been completely cleared for a big development project. That forest where they were, were gone. So I suddenly struck me that I could continue going on studying these various species and having a lot of fun and traveling to really cool places around the world, but at some point they would all be gone or greatly diminished, or I could try to use my science, perhaps, to do something about the fact that um, all of these species and their habitats were disappearing, or really their habitats and then the species were disappearing. So this was a real game changer for me. And so then I became more of an applied scientist. Although the problem I have is I never uh, drop anything. So then I just kept my basic science going, and now I've added applied science to it. You'll see, and then I'll add more things onto it. Um, and what I did was I, I came down in altitude. Instead of being in, at, at high altitude or in very dry forests, I went to low altitudes and very wet forests, which were areas under really extreme pressure where lots of habitat was disappearing very, very quickly. Um, this is a picture in Sumatra. This forest is actually gone. It's not there anymore. Um, so the, these forests, and I'll talk about deforestation later, and I started studying all kinds. I branched out. I didn't just work on primates, but I started working on all kinds of other vertebrates um, in these forests. So I'll give you an example of how you take the science of genetics and apply it to a real problem. So this is the, what I'm going to talk about is the Javan rhino that lives in Southeast Asia. It's probably, it is, the most endangered large mammal in the world. There are probably somewhere in the region of 70 to 80 of them left in the wild. There are none in captivity. So it's a species really on the brink. And the, I'm going to talk about molecular evolutionary tree building. That is, building evolutionary trees using molecular data. OK, so there's the Javan rhinoceros. You see it has a single horn at the end, just one horn. Some of the rhinos, the ones in Africa, for instance, have two horns. Um, and this is a very rare photo in that the photo is of the animal out during the day. It's rare that Javan rhinos will come out during the day. And I'll explain why in a little bit. OK. So 
many people believe that the Javan rhino was just a subspecies of the other one horned rhino, which you can see over on the left, sometimes called the greater one horned rhino or the Indian rhino. Okay? And we wanted to find out whether that was true, because if it's just a subspecies and there are very few individuals left, you might not put so much time and effort into it, and you might put more time and effort into those other populations uh, that you see in Nepal and India, because they're larger and they're more viable. Okay, so we used molecules to reconstruct an evolutionary tree, and that's basically a tree of relationships. And as you can see where the red circle is, the one on top, which says rhinoceros unicornis, that's the bigger one. And the one on the bottom, that's the Javan rhino, Sundaicus. Okay. Now, if you look along the branches, you'll see numbers. If you add those two numbers up, 52 and 53, it tells you how much evolutionary divergence there has been, how many nucleotides in the DNA have changed since they shared a common ancestor in the particular genes that we were looking at. And you'll see it's 105. Now, people said that they were subspecies of one species. Well, this is interesting. It was interesting to us. Because if you look down here and you add 42 and 69, right, you get 111. So there are only 111 differences between the white rhino and the black rhino of Africa. And those are not considered two separate species. They're considered in two separate genera, two, two different genera, which is a very, very significant evolutionary difference in order to say they're in, each in a different genus. Okay? Whereas the ones on top, which are just as different, were thought to be subspecies of the same species. So we reported this back as saying, this is clearly not true. These are at least separate species, if not each in a separate genus, and have had their own evolutionary history separated from the other for a very long period of time. Okay. So in the language that we use, we said these two, two groups of organisms are evolutionarily significant units. You might call them species or genera or whatever. Okay? We're just calling them evolutionarily significant units. Then we thought, well, we're going to look at the Javan rhino because there are two populations, one in Vietnam and one in the island of Java. You can see them there. Now, you see the one on the, on the left, that picture, is a picture that was taken with a, uh, a photo uh, camera trap. And the reason it's taken with a camera trap which is a beam of light, and when the animal crosses the beam of light, the camera flashes a picture. The reason is that almost all of these animals, not by nature, not by their evolutionary history, but because of strong selection by the human population, are nocturnal. They only come out at night, because the ones that came out during the day got shot. Okay, so you strongly select for individuals that will only come out at night. And so the only way to find out whether they're there is to set up a camera trap, have them cross this beam, and take a picture of them. Otherwise, you'd never know they're there. I mean, I've worked in the national park in, in Indonesia, where they, where they are, Ujang Kulan National Park, and there are park guards who have been there for years and have never seen a Javan rhino. As soon as you put out camera traps, bingo, the next night you find Javan rhinos. Okay. In any case, these are the two populations in Katlak in Vietnam and in Ujang Kulan in, uh, in the island of Java. And we wanted to look at the differences. And indeed, if you look at, again, add up the, the numbers on the branches, you'll see that these are just as different as these two subspecies are of black rhino. And those two subspecies of black rhino have had so many millions of dollars poured into their conservation because they're separate subspecies. And yet no one ever thought to look at these. And when we looked at them, we found out that they were just as different and really required each of them requiring their own separate management and their own separate investment. And so you'll see we use this other term, MU, which is a management unit. And we defined these two management units in Vietnam and in Kulan, in Java. Now, there's our Javan rhino again, and there is U Ujan Kulan National Park. That's the, where they are. Now, there's an interesting thing. How many of you know about Krakatoa or Krakatau, right? So you know that Krakatoa is, or Krakatau, the real name is misspelled here, actually, in a map created by the New York Times. They do get things wrong. Um, there was a movie that came out back when I was a kid called Krakatoa East of Java. Uh, the I think it had like Charlton Heston or who, I don't know who was in it. Uh, two interesting things. First of all, it's Krakatau, not Krakatoa. And secondly, it's west of Java, not east of Java. But other than that, the title was totally accurate. Um, if you look there, you'll see it's way out on the tip of the island of Java, right? Now, if you know about Krakatoa, you know in 1883, Krakatoa blew. It was such an enormous explosion. Um, that actually uh, it covered uh, the, the atmosphere with a layer of dust 
that blocked out, not blocked out the sun, but diminished the rays of the sun, so much so that it actually snowed in Boston in July. That's how cool it was. Okay? The sound of this was heard, and the effects of this were heard in Europe. And this is happening on the island of Java, so you can get a sense. It caused a tsunami just like the tsunami that, uh, that we had recently in the Indian Ocean, hitting exactly the same places, because the entire volcano um, collapsed into the ocean, causing this huge reverberating waves going out, hit exactly the same places in Indonesia, in India, in Sri Lanka. The only difference was the population was very small at that time, and people were not living along the coast, because that was not a good place to live. Everyone knew that. And so the number of deaths were actually fairly minimal. Um, but it essentially happened. Now, what concerns me about having most of the Javan rhinos, this is 90% of the Javan rhinos there, is this picture right here. If you look at that picture closely, you'll see it looks like a volcano. And that's what it is. This is called Anak Krakatau. Anak Krakatau means son of Krakatau. And what's happening is that fault line is still there. And so it's just growing back up. And it's growing back up quickly at about one foot a month. That grows. That peak, you see, is growing about one foot a month. Okay? Now, eventually, that's going to blow. And if all of your Javan rhinos are in that basket right there, that's it for the Javan rhino. So we have made, we've said this is a very important management unit of the Javan rhinos, the most important one, and that you have to disperse these animals into other areas, um, find other suitable habitat and disperse them into other areas. There are other genetic reasons for doing that. So that's, that's basically how we're using genetics to try to develop management plans for species. <clears throat> and, okay. But then I realized that, you know how many species there are? There are millions of species. There are many people like me you would need. You, don't, you really don't want more than one of me, but I mean, sort of do the things I do, uh, you would need. Uh, you, know, you would need millions to come up with management plans for all these different species. That's not going to happen. There aren't the people, there, there isn't the money, it's not going to happen. So we have to begin to think about how we're going to attack some of these issues on a much, much larger scale. So then I added another layer, which I call citizen scientist, which is the scientist trying to, to take his science or her science and use it to help policymakers develop the very best policy based on science. You probably don't remember the UN Millennium Summit in 2000, but you do know a few weeks ago they were celebrating the 10th anniversary here in New York of this. And the same thing was true in 2000 and 2010. The most impressive part to New Yorkers about this was the, how bad the traffic was in the city and how impossible it was to get to Midtown and how annoyed they were that they were doing this. But it actually did something in addition to that. And it created something called the Millennium Development Goals, which some of you may have heard about. Maybe not a large number of you, that's part of the problem, um, but some of you may have heard about them. One of the Millennium Development Goals, I mean, they're really good goals, eradicate poverty, achieve primary education, promote gender equality, reduce child mortality. I mean, this is all mom and apple pie stuff. Everybody wants to do this. One of them was ensure environmental sustainability, and I was asked to co-chair a task force on this, and we created this report uh, uh, out of that task force, um, Environment and Human Well-Being, a Practical Strategy. And um, unlike many other UN reports, which usually are released, everyone at some big event, and uh, there are copies piled up there, and uh, at the end of it, there's champagne for everyone uh, for the release of the report, and everyone takes one of these back to their office and puts it on their shelf. It collects dust, and about two, every two years, they clean out their office. It goes into the round file, and that's the end of the year. That's the general life history of a UN report. Um, we decided we would actually try to make this stick a little bit. So in that picture on the bottom, we have actually officials from a variety of countries that we were hoping, that had come forward and asked us if we would try to apply some of our recommendations in their country. Um, what does the report say? The most important sentence in the report is the following. Environmental sustainability is essential to achieving all other Millennium Development Goals. You're not going to get gender equality. You're not going to reduce infant mortality. You're not going to get any of those things done poverty, uh, slu uh, reduced slum dwelling, and all that, if, in fact, the very infrastructure upon which all of those problems are hinged is eroding out from under you. So what we argued was that nature was the infrastructure and that all of those things that we think we need every day, which we do, right, they all actually are related to 
the, the nature and the condition that nature is in. And if you translate this into the Millennium Development Goals speak, environmental sustainability is at the center of everything, and all the other problems you see are symptoms of a core disease, and the core disease is the decline of nature. That's the core disease. And everything else is a symptom. Well, you can attack the symptoms. That's what medicine does all the time, is attack symptoms. But if you ask any public health specialist, they will tell you that is a very expensive way of going about dealing with a problem. Prevention is much cheaper than dealing with symptoms. <clears throat> so how do we achieve environmental sustainability? I'll give you one way in which we're doing it. Okay. So we've heard about this problem with increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide and increasing land, land and ocean temperatures. Right Now, people may argue about what the cause of this is, but no one can argue that this is happening because you can measure it fairly readily. Okay. So you've seen both of those are going up over time. This is a period. Uh, I'm really looking at the period from like 1960 on, but obviously it's been going up for a much longer period of time than that. We've also seen another thing, and that is increases in deforestation around the world. Very high levels of deforestation around the world. Why, should, why does that matter, really? Well, with rising temperatures, uh, we have rising sea levels. That doesn't matter for Morningside Heights. We're pretty far above the sea level, but if you live in one of the small island developing states in the Pacific, and you're maybe one meter above sea level, it matters a lot when sea level goes up. Many of those countries have already created evacuation plans for their entire country. They're expecting their entire country to go underwater. That's pretty amazing if you think about it. Um, we've seen tropical storm severity. There's still a lot of argument about whether increased surface temperature of the ocean is what's causing increases in tropical storm severity. Um, it's a great area for scientific research. It's not at all resolved. And biodiversity loss, and along with the loss of biodiversity, is the loss of the services that those biodivers that, that biodiversity supplies for us. So, for instance, water quality and pest control and pollination and disease buffering. So there are all those consequences. Okay, so how do we fix this problem? Well, scientists say we have to keep uh, the temperature at about 2 degrees centigrade above what it was in pre-industrial time. To do that, we have to stabilize CO2 at about 450 parts per million in the atmosphere which means re reducing industrialized country CO2 emissions by 80% uh, of 2,000 levels by 2050. That means going 80% below where we were at 2,000 by 2050. This is a huge task to attempt to, to make this happen. Um, one of the ways we can actually deal with this is controlling tropical deforestation. And I would imagine that very few of you know that that's a good way to control CO2 emissions. Because right? you think mostly of factories. We think of the left. You don't think of the right. Okay, so there are the three big forests, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and the island of New Guinea. Okay. And these are all the reasons that forests are taken down, cattle ranching, agriculture, mining, timber. Emissions from deforestation. If I told you, I'm wondering if you would believe me, but um, one acre of forest, of tropical forest, disappears every second. Okay, think of what an acre is. Okay. Some of you live in houses, maybe you live on a quarter of an acre plot. Think of an acre of forest, disappears every second. Okay, So many acres of tropical forest have disappeared since I started talking. Um, one city block is about five and a half acres. So that means in five and a half seconds, a forest the size of an entire city block right, will disappear. About 15% of the CO2 emissions annually into the atmosphere come from deforestation. That's one out of every seven tons that goes into the atmosphere comes from deforestation. Right? And so if this continues the way it is going, all of those emission reductions that have been achieved through the Kyoto Protocol will be completely eradicated over the same period of time by all the deforestation that's going on. To give you another view of this, the first and second biggest emitters, this is a, a 2000 graph, those have actually flipped, China's now the biggest emitter, but China and the United States are the biggest emitters of CO2, right? The third and fourth largest emitters of CO2 are Indonesia and Brazil, and they do not have large industrial complexes. That's coming from deforestation. 75% of that's coming from deforestation, okay? And they are the third and fourth largest emitters of CO2. They emit more CO2 than Japan. They emit more CO2 than any European country. They emit more CO2 than any other country except the United States and, and um, uh, China <clears throat> because of this deforestation. 
So, let me show you what forest cover trends look like in a country over time. You start out with a lot of forest, and then a lot of it gets cut in a tropical country. Then it sort of stabilizes out. And if the country has achieved some level of economic development, it begins to replant plantation forests to cover lands that were formerly forested. Okay? You can find countries at different stages here. But we're working with many, many other people around the world, we're just one group, to do something. Okay. There is already something called the Clean Development Mechanism to try to promote the planting of forest. We're trying to work on a mechanism called Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation, RED, which is trying to change that curve, flatten that curve out so you don't get all that deforestation to start with. Now, you might ask, well, that's nice. How are you going to do that? Right? After all, it's been going on. What makes you so smart? Um, well, here's the logic. Okay? If a hectare of forest, does everyone know what a hectare measure is? It's about two and a half acres. It's how most of the world measures land. We use acres, but most of the world uses hectares. So it's two and a half acres. So if a hectare of forest is cleared, the carbon stored, and that's going to go up into the atmosphere. All of it's going to go eventually. A hectare of intact, more, it's close, of, of tropical forest, say in the Amazon, has about 150 to 240 tons of carbon. But we measure what's going in the atmosphere as CO2. So we have to add two molecules of oxygen to that. And um, we have to create CO2. And that means, if you remember your chemistry, that means oxygen's a little heavier than carbon. So in fact, it's not three times the amount. It's 3.67 times the amount. So it means there's about 500 to 750 tons of CO2 equivalents. In one hectare, one two and a half acre plot, you cut it down and burn it, it goes up to the atmosphere. Okay, 750 tons of CO2. So not cutting it means you're not emitting 750 tons of CO2. Okay. Now, a forest owner in Brazil who decides not to cut that, so he's not emitting CO2, 750 tons of CO2, should receive some, the same carbon credits that a factory owner in Belgium who reduces his emissions by 750 tons. But you want to know what that forest owner gets? That forest owner gets nothing. Factory owner gets probably something on the order of 10 to $20 per ton. Factory owner gets, I mean, the forest owner gets nothing. This doesn't make any sense. In terms of equity, it doesn't make any sense. And in terms of trying to prevent the forest from being cut down, it makes even less sense. So what Red is trying to do is saying, if you don't cut down your forest, okay, we can show, we can measure to within 98% accuracy how much CO2 you're not putting up into the atmosphere. And those can be turned into what are called emissions reduction units, which is what they're doing in Europe now, right, for factory owners. And you get emissions reduction units that you can sell on the market. Why are you selling it on the market? Because there's a factory somewhere in Indiana or in Helsinki or whatever that wants to emit the CO2. And in order for them to reduce their CO2, it's very expensive to outfit their, their factory. So what they can do is they can buy your reductions instead of emitting themselves. Now, some of you might get, oh, this is crazy. And I don't have the time to explain. But after, if people want to stay, I'll explain this in more detail. But what we did was we brought the science into this and said, look, let's look at what we're trying to do scientifically. Okay? Let's integrate this into economics and policy. And let's create a policy that's going to provide an economic incentive for forest owners not to cut their forest. To ask forest owners not to cut their forest for the good of humankind is going to work as well as everything else you ask people to do for the good of humankind. Mean, not at all. Okay? But if you can provide an economic incentive, then, in fact, you can get something done. And that's what we we're trying to do here. And this is just showing the kinds of costs you have to, these are the opportunity costs that you're foregoing if you do soybeans or ranching or all that. And that's what we're trying to match. So I looked up today on um, Price Carbon, which is um, a website that has the price of, of these emission reduction units. And today, the emission reduction unit, well, actually, it was Friday, was worth $21.70. So now think about a hectare of forest that's 750 tons at $21. Get out your whatever electronic device of one sort or another, your smartphone or whatever. Don't use it as a phone, but you can do your calculation. And you'll see that it's actually quite a bit of money per hectare. Now imagine if you own 10,000 hectares. Right? This is, you're a community. You own 10,000 hectares. You're a community. I, I work with communities now in Colombia who, uh, through my counterparts in Colombia, who have 100,000 hectares. Okay? Now you're talking about a real economic incentive not to cut the forest down. 
And when you don't cut the forest down, you're not emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, and you're not losing the forest and all the services that it supplies, soil stabilization and everything else that it supplies, all those things I taught, the biodiversity within it. Okay, so the idea is multilateral agreements to limit carbon emissions, we're hoping, they're in the works. If they're extended to avoided deforestation, so you can monetize not cutting down the forest, you now have a competing value for the forests versus logging or agriculture or anything else. And it's been at least modeled that about $20 billion into the market for avoided deforestation will cut tropical deforestation in half worldwide. Now, $20 billion is nothing. I mean, it may seem like a lot to you, and it is a lot. Um, but I mean, in a capital market, it's nothing. It's a round-off error, $20 billion. And that would cut tropical deforestation worldwide in half. Okay. So this is the way in which you can bring science, economics, and policy together in the hopes of trying to make major transformations that are going to have huge implications for biodiversity and huge implications for ecosystems in which that biodiversity lives. Okay, so let me just sum up because I've been out here like So if you become a scientist, you can have fun in the field, okay, going to really cool places. You can have fun in the lab if labs are places you like to have fun in. Um, in addition, you get to do things like this, like here I'm signing an agreement with the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea to help launch a national program in Papua New Guinea. Um, there's Papua New Guinea, perhaps the most interesting place I've ever been to in my life, um, but I don't have time to tell you why. Um, it's the uh, eastern half of the island of New Guinea. Um, you can even do this, which happened about 10 days ago. I had a meeting with the President of the Dominican Republic, an impromptu meeting, and you know where I am? Who knows where I am? I'm in the Columbia Bookstore. I'm standing in the Columbia Bookstore. There's the President in the middle and the First Lady uh, to, to my right, his left. Um, and we were discussing a project that uh, he invited me to do in the Dominican Republic, uh, which we're currently doing, and he was here for the UN General Assembly and he absolutely loves books. Um, by the way, I need to back up and say one other thing. I know I'm talking a lot, but this Prime Minister, this is Sir Michael Somari, Prime Minister, he is actually the George Washington of Papua New Guinea. He is the father of Papua New Guinea. He took Papua New Guinea independent 35 years ago. He was Prime Minister, then he wasn't Prime Minister, now he's Prime Minister again. He's an extraordinary individual, actually. Um, the, Leonel Fernandez, the President of the Dominican Republic, really likes books, so he happened to be in the Columbia Bookstore, and he had his, uh, one of his colleagues, the, the man on the left, give me a call. I only live two blocks from the Columbia Bookstore, so I ran down really quickly. I was watching the Giants game, and so I figured. I wasn't watching the Giants game in a, in a, in a suit. I quickly changed. Um, anyway, we're working in this area you see on the lower right. Um, so you get to do stuff like that. Um, Dominican Republic. And so how, how can you live the life of an active scientist? Uh, come to Columbia and get your feet wet. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>